Hello, everyone. Good evening. How's everybody doing tonight? Good. I, uh, before I jump into my intro um, for tonight's Science on Screen presentation, I just want to mention I've been told the concession stand is closing at 8.15 tonight. So if you need another glass of something special or popcorn, <laughs> make sure you get to the concession before 8.15. Um, Okay, so uh, some of you probably recognize me from the last Science on Screen presentation, which was Nightmare on Elm Street, and it was fabulous. If you missed that, I believe we posted the video. Um, I think it's accessible via our, our Facebook page. Our YouTube page. Our YouTube page. Thank you, Bob. Bob, our marketing director, who a lot of you know. Um, so do check that out. Um, it, it might be of interest to you if you're a horror fan. Um, but we are very excited to be presenting Science on Screen for a fifth year this year. I'm Emily Simmons, Development Director here at the Colonial Theater. And on behalf of the entire staff, I just want to welcome you back if you're coming back for the first time. And also, thank you so much. I mean, as an audience member, you're a critical part of the show. So we really appreciate the support that you've given us over the last year. It's why we're able to be here today. Um, and just thank you. Thanks again. So, um, Science on Screen is a grant-funded film series made possible by the Coolidge Corner Theater Foundation in Boston, with major support from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Science on Screen features creative pairings, like the one where you're going to see tonight, of current, classic, cult, and documentary films with lively introductions by notable figures from the world of science, technology, and medicine. Our invited scientist tonight, astronomer Dr. Karen Schwartz, We'll explore our obsession with Mars, a very timely subject always in the 21st century, immediately following tonight's film, which is Total Recall, as you know. The god of war, Martians, rovers, and human colonization. For over a century, Mars has fascinated us. It has permeated our popular culture and our scientific inquiries. Why are we so drawn to this red planetary neighbor of ours? And what have we learned from our explorations? Dr. Schwartz will talk about the facts and the fictions of Mars. I also hope you'll join us for our next and final science on screen film or event of the season. We're only doing three this year. Typically, we do about five. Um, that will be the fountain in June. Apollo 13 begins its run tomorrow, for those of you who are space crazy like me. Um, and feature films are returning to our screens this week with Tony Collette and Dreamhouse the chilling and important documentary final account, and the Saudi Arabian drama, The Perfect Candidate. For details and tickets, visit the box office or our website. And now we hope you enjoy Total Recall. How many people still want to go to Mars? Yeah, I think I'd sign up. <laughs> All right, tonight's invited scientist and speaker is Dr. Karen Schwartz. She is an associate professor in the Department of Earth and Space Sciences at West Chester University. She also serves as director of both the Mather Planetarium and West Chester University's Project Astro site, which is a national program that improves astronomical and physical science education in K-12 classrooms by linking professional and amateur astronomers with local educators. So if any of you are, are amateur astronomers, you might want to check out Project Astro. In her role at the Mather Planetarium, Dr. Schwartz presents over 80 shows a year to school groups and the general public. Every fall, she runs Super Science Saturday, which is a one-day event designed to encourage middle and high school girls to pursue careers in STEM. Dr. Schwartz's scientific research is in the area of interacting binary stars. In particular, she studies elemental abundances in classical novae. Recently, she has moved into astronomy education research. Dr. Schwartz is interested in assessing the impact that informal education settings have on student learning. Currently, she's investigating how modern planetarium programming can aid students to develop a conceptually accurate understanding of lunar physics, lunar phases, excuse me. Dr. Schwartz received her BS in physics from the New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology and her PhD in astrophysics from Arizona State University. We invite you after the show tonight to learn more about the Mather Planetarium and the Department of Earth and Space Sciences at wcupa.edu. And after Dr. Schwartz's presentation, we are gonna test a new Q&A method using, I believe, a QR code on 
um, our screen. So if you uh, don't want to take the mic and ask a question, you can actually use that code to text your question, um, and we'll work it into the Q&A after the program. So without further ado, Dr. Schwartz. All right, so imagine it is 1938 and you and your family have finished dinner and are deciding that maybe you'd like to spend the evening listening to the radio, some nice programming. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the latest bulletin from the Intercontinental Radio News. Toronto, Canada. Professor Morse of Macmillan University reports observing a total of three explosions on the planet Mars between the hours of 7.45 p.m. and 9.20 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This confirms earlier reports received from American observatories. Now nearer home comes a special bulletin from Trenton, New Jersey. It is reported that at 8.50 p.m. a huge flaming object believed to be a meteorite, fell on a farm in the neighborhood of Grover's Mill, New Jersey, 22 miles from Trenton. The flash in the sky was visible within a radius of several hundred miles, and the noise of the impact was heard as far north as Elizabeth. We have dispatched a special mobile unit to the scene, and we'll have our commentator, Carl Phillips, give you a word picture of the scene as soon as he can reach there from Princeton. In the meantime, we take you to the Hotel Martinet in Brooklyn, where Bobby Millett and his orchestra are offering a program of dance music. And over the next 10 to 15 minutes, Carl Phillips is going to inform the radio audience that it was not in fact a meteorite that fell in New Jersey, but rather an alien spacecraft. And out of that alien spacecraft, we will find Martians emerging who immediately fall to destroying the earthlings with death rays and poisonous gas. That was perhaps not what you expected when you turned the radio on that evening. A lot of people were not expecting that when they turned the radio on that evening. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. So let's take a step back and talk about why are we so obsessed with Mars? There's a lot of good stuff about Mars, science fiction and science. Uh, let's go back to the earliest times. Mars was one of the first planets that the Romans and the Greeks looked at in the ancient, uh, the ancient astronomers in the sky. It was one of the wanderers, the planets. That was their word for the wanderers in the sky. These things moved separately from the stars. They wandered around. They didn't know much more than that. They, there was this little red dot in the sky named after the god of war, but it wandered around like the other four wanderers, the other planets in the sky. And so for a long time, that's really all we knew about it until the invention of the telescope. And the early telescopes didn't leave a lot to the imagination, or maybe left too much to the imagination. This was one of the earliest maps of Mars, Christian Huygens. Uh, so this is a very early telescope. The telescope's only having been invented in about 19, sorry, 1609. So that, from that picture, we can tell that there's some variation across the disk of the planet, but not a whole lot more. We have to wait a little bit longer for better telescopes. And in 1877, there was the great opposition of Mars, where Mars is on the opposite side of the sky from the sun, making it most bright and a little bit larger than it would normally look. And so that was perfect for telescopic viewing. And during that time, we learned a lot more about it. This is a small telescope view of Mars and its two moons. The moons were predicted, but not known until 1877. They were predicted kind of uh, in a funny way. So we knew that Earth had a moon and then there was Mars. And then on the other side of Mars is Jupiter. And at that time, Jupiter was known to have four. So if Earth has one and Jupiter has four, then of course Mars should have two. <laughs> that was the thinking. <laughs> so it was predicted that Mars would have a couple of moons. And it's an interesting story in and of itself. Asaph Hall was the observer that discovered these moons and he searched for them for many years based on the idea that there should be two. And he was getting rather discouraged after his long search and not finding anything. And so he was kind of ready to throw in the towel but his wife encouraged him to keep going. And he then in 1877 discovered these two moons. 
So there's a little moral in that story, right? Listen to your wife. <laughs> and these moons are named Phobos and Deimos. So Phobos and Deimos mean fear and dread, which are the natural companions of the god of war. So this is a slightly better image of Mars. We can tell that there's still those dark things that Huygens sketched out in his very early uh, diagrams. But of course, Asaph Hall was not the only person looking at Mars in 1877. There were a lot of people that had some much better telescopes at that time. So those astronomers started making better maps of Mars. This is possibly one of the best of that time period. An Italian astronomer, Giovanni Scaparelli, sketched out Mars with its seas and its continents and its canali. So the seas are the dark areas, the mares, that's the Latin for seas. And then the brighter areas are the continents as he imagined them, he named them. A lot of those names still, still stick on Mars. And then the intricate lines at the top, the canali. At this point, we have to introduce a very important person into this story. His name is Percival Lowell. Percival Lowell was a businessman in Boston, and he actually had a degree in mathematics from Harvard. He heard about Scaparelli's Canali, and he made the understandably mistaken translation of that word, Canali, sounds like canal. It doesn't actually mean canal. The Italian word Canali stands for channels. Now, we might say we're picking, you know, uh, we're nitpicking here, canal, can, uh, sorry, can, canals versus channels. What's the difference? There's actually a really important but subtle difference between those two, right? Channels are naturally occurring things. Canals are man-made. So when Lowell heard about the canali and translated it as canals, he got very excited about the idea of people living on Mars, Martians. And he dedicated the remainder of his life to building an observatory and observing Mars. So he's a very wealthy guy, built a really nice observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona. Lowell Observatory is still in Flagstaff, Arizona. It still does amazing science. He built this telescope that he's looking through as the first telescope. It's a 24-inch diameter telescope, which is a really nice sized telescope. And he was able to see a lot on Mars with this telescope, and he published four books on Mars and its inhabitants. This is Lowell's map of Mars. It's very, very detailed. What he imagined the canals were doing were taking the water in the polar ice caps, which we already knew at this point that Mars had polar ice caps, from the top and the bottom there and taking it to the cities because the rest of Mars was very arid. So he imagined this very advanced but very desperate situation for this civilization that they needed to get the waters to their cities, which are the dark areas connected by all of the canals. So this is what Mars, so this is what Lowell spent many decades doing. The problem is most of the other astronomers at this time, this is now uh, in the late 1800s going into the early 1900s, they didn't see the canals, or if they did, they saw very few of them, and it wasn't nearly as intricate as what Lowell has imagined in his drawing. So he didn't have a lot of backing. And then shortly after this, in about 1910, the California Mount Wilson Observatory was established with a 60-inch telescope much better telescope. It could see brighter, more detailed objects, and no canals. So by the time 1920 rolled around, pretty much all of the astronomers and the scientific community determined that Mars did not have any canals, there were no beings on Mars, there was no civilization trying to save themselves using the polar ice water. But that didn't matter. The idea of Martians was born and it took off in popular culture like nobody's business. Lots of books, eventually television shows, radio shows like Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater reading their adaptation of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds on the radio. October 30th, 1939. This show was very interesting in that it did not have any um, commercial breaks, they could take breaks when they wanted to. And this was the first time anybody on theater radio had done this 
uh, mimicking of news reporting. And so some people tuned in a little late after the introduction about what was going to be on the program tonight. They tuned in about where we did and actually thought this was a real breaking news. So there was a lot of flurry of the media about how many people had been duped by this. It's probably greatly exaggerated, people know now, that not so many people were really that confused. And then there's this whole business that this is 1938, we're leading up to World War II here, and this is gonna be, you know, this is, people are very confused about what's going on. The war has caused a lot of panic in and of itself for the idea of war. So perhaps this, this is a little misleading newspaper headline here, but some people did in fact think that this was real and police showed up at the radio station to shut the program down basically right at the very end, so they actually got to finish the program, but they were in a lot of trouble. So there was a lot of interest in Mars. It doesn't stop there. We just saw a wonderful film about Mars, right? And there are really good films, science fiction films about Mars. There are also some real questionable films about Mars. <laughs> but I would be remiss if I didn't mention my favorite. That is an interplanetary flying <laughs> space saucer. We are returning to Mars in it. So wonderful pop culture about Mars. And it's great to have science fiction about Mars. The science is great, the science fiction is great, and they kind of feed off of each other. The science starts it out, the science fiction takes over. It inspires people, it, cre it creates ideas about Mars, which then new scientists are born out of that to go and actually do the exploring. So eventually we do get to go to Mars, right? Not in Mar Marvin the Martian's spaceship, but we do get to go to Mars. And it's not just one or two, it's a lot. We have sent more space missions to Mars than any other planet in the solar, any other object in the solar system. So I'm listing them here. The ones that don't have anything after them are the US missions, the other ones are noted. And more and more countries are getting into the game of Mars. So these are all of the successful missions. I didn't bother to put the ones up there that didn't make it. There's a few of them, and some of them were embarrassingly so, uh, but those are the ones that made it. Uh, we have Mariner missions were the first. They were flybys and orbiters. Uh, and then eventually the Viking landers came the first time we landed on Mars. This all starts in about 1964. So we sent flybys and orbiters to Mars before we landed on the moon. Uh, the Viking landers were in the 70s. And then we got to skip around a bunch till we get to Pathfinder, the very first rover on Mars, which is in the 90s, kind of a big jump, but a lot of new technology in the meantime. And then there's another big jump for the first, and that is, of course, Mars 2020 with the first helicopter on, on any other planet, let alone Mars. Helicopter drone, I think they like to call it a helicopter, but it's really very small. Um, so those are all of the missions that have been there, and these are the ones that are still operational. So some of the ones that launched in the 90s are still actually collecting data and doing great work there on Mars. So a lot of information, but again, why Mars? Why not something else? Why is Mars so popular? There's a lot of reasons for Mars being popular. It's close by. Right? It's just the next planet over. It's very interesting in that it's similar to Earth, but it's different than Earth. Um, we've been watching it for a long time. This is actually a Hubble Space Telescope picture of Mars. So this is taken from Earth orbit, not that far away. Um, and it's a great picture because it shows the polar cap at the north. You can still see the dark and light splotches that even Huygens drew back in the 1600s. Um, the difference between the dark areas and the light areas uh, we now know is just reflection. And the lighter areas that are the red color are covered in dust, uh, dust that is high in iron oxide and that's what gives it that wonderful red color. The darker areas simply don't have a lot of dust on them and they're showing the base rock underneath that is mostly volcanic in nature. We can also see this blue hue in this picture, which is Mars's atmosphere. It's very, very thin, and it's made entirely of carbon dioxide. So not a really nice place to visit, as we saw in the movie just a minute ago. Um, but the other thing I want to point out is way over on the left, right on the side, you see a little round circle. That is the largest volcano in the solar system that is at home on Mars. So Mars has got some things that are a lot like the Earth, just a little bit different. So the atmosphere, a little bit thinner, made out of different stuff. The polar ice caps made out of frozen water and frozen carbon dioxide. 
so that's a little bit different. The volcano, Olympus Mons, largest volcano in the solar system. It has a five foot high cliff all around it. It's a shield volcano, like those on the, that make up the Hawaiian Islands, only much, much bigger. And just to, you know, we can throw out numbers, but just to show you how big this thing is, it takes up the land mass of the state of Arizona and it's three times taller than Mount Everest. It's a really big volcano. Now that thing is no longer erupting, at least it hasn't been erupting since we've been watching it, but scientists think that it may have erupted for millions of years continuously to produce such a large structure. The other thing on Mars that we could see long before we landed was Valles Marineris. This is the largest canyon system in the solar system. This is a tectonic feature. It is not an erosional feature, but it basically produces a canyon the same way that we have canyons on the Earth. Our most notable canyon in the United States is the Grand Canyon. Some people have maybe spent their summer vacations visiting it. It's very, very majestic and impressive. It doesn't hold a candle to Valles Marineris. Valles Marineris would stretch across the entire country. You can see there is our little tiny Grand Canyon, not so grand in this picture. It would fit in one of the little side tributaries of this massive structure. This canyon wraps about one fifth of the way around the planet. So we can see some really amazing things on this planet from space. If we land, of course, we get a lot more detail. So, this is the first Pathfinder landing site. The Viking landers landed first 20 years before, but this is better technology. And it's the first rover, right? Rover Sojourner is off in the left-hand corner of the bottom. This is a panorama that you can't put on one slide, so you gotta read it all the way across and then read it all the way across the bottom again. And this is an example of why you should never let anyone who hasn't had sleep in the last 24 hours name anything. These are terrible, <laughs> really goofy names because these people had worked for a really long time and then hadn't slept a lot. But this is what one of the landing sites looks like. This is a floodplain on Mars. And what you can see, I have to talk about the technology for just a minute. I love the landing design of this spacecraft. So we have to get this rover to the surface. And how do you get it to the surface? Well, they took the really simple, like third grade classroom idea approach. We're just gonna drop it. So that's exactly what happened with this rover and its craft. It was in a nice little shell and the whole thing was dropped to the surface of the planet. They use a parachute, but the parachute doesn't work very well because the atmosphere isn't very thin, so it slows it down a little bit. And then they just inflated enormous airbags all around this thing and let it bounce, which I thought was beautifully simple. So it bounced and it bounced and eventually came to a stop. It did have a mechanism to right itself if it wasn't right side up because this sort of triangular structure had to open like a flower. So you gotta make sure it's right side up. And that's what you see here. You see the deflated airbags and you see some of the petals of the flower and then the rover just drove on out. It worked beautifully and they, it was so great they did it two more times for the next two rovers. Eventually they had to change it, but that was a really great design. So here's our rover exploring this area of Mars and we learned a ton about the rocks in the area. And I wanna show you a little bit more here. Why do we care so much about various areas? Water on Mars. That is one of the big questions. So there's lots of, like I said, lots of reasons to explore Mars. Those similarities are one, volcanoes, canyons, but also the differences. And one of the big differences is Mars doesn't have any liquid water. However, there's a lot of evidence that it used to. This is a river valley. These are branching rivers coming off of a main river, right? That is on Mars, that's on the surface of Mars. No water though evidence that there used to be water, but no water now. More evidence of water. This is an area that shows much more um, rapid and larger amount of water flowing. So this would be what we would consider like evidence of a flood, a floodplain on Mars. Again, no water there right now. And in fact, we can't have liquid water on Mars. The conditions on Mars don't support liquid water. The pressure and the temperature are not right to have water in the liquid state, only in the frozen state or in the vapor in the atmosphere. So the question has been for a long time, where did the water go? 
When the rovers came and they started tootling around Mars, they dug up soil that was this bright white stuff. This is salt. Salt that is now in the soil that used to be possibly suspended in oceans, right? A salty water. And so lots of evidence. Last little piece here, another rover discovery. These little tiny things that were nicknamed blueberries, they are little tiny balls of hematite, which is a mineral on Earth that only exists in the presence of standing water. So now we actually have to have water sitting around on the surface for a while in order to create this. So lots and lots of evidence of water in the past but where is it now? Where did the liquid water go, right? Is this something that we need to worry about? Is this something that's gonna to happen to our planet? So many similarities and yet this big difference. And of course it's important because all organisms on our planet need liquid water to survive. There are organisms that can do without the sun. If the sun disappeared, they wouldn't care. But we all need liquid water. Life as we know it needs liquid water. So Mars seems to have had a nice wet past for at least some significant amount of time, but no longer. And that's what many of the missions have been looking for on Mars, the answers to where did the water go. We have some ideas, we don't have the full answer yet. But feeding off of that, our latest mission to Mars, Perseverance, the last rover that was just sent and landed earlier last year, that is not no longer trying to answer where is the water, but could there have been life in that water? It's not there anymore. We're not really looking for that advanced civilization that's gonna come here and start a war or send Marvin the Martian. But what about previous life? Could it still be there, maybe not, but is there evidence that it ever was there? So where do we go looking? We go looking where the water was. Perseverance landed in Jezero Crater, which you're seeing just the half of it on the right-hand side of the slide, and it's at the mouth of a river where there appears to be a delta, a river delta, right there in that swirly part, right? So you have the river that comes down and it dumps into this crater and all of the sediment, just like on Earth, is carried downstream and deposited. So had there ever been life on Mars in that liquid water, we may expect to find some evidence of it in this deposit area. And this is where Perseverance is now, going around and drilling out samples of the rock looking for fossils. So that's the latest mission on Mars, trying to look for evidence of past life. We're not really looking for the spying, flying saucers anymore, but we're looking for evidence of past life. And could it have developed there, right? So lots and lots of reasons to go check out our nearest neighbor, or as I should know, technically not nearest, Venus is nearest, but our nearest Earth-like neighbor, just one planet out. So a lot of questions that we have about it, we're working on the answers, but always looking for more information, right? And so that whole feedback of science, creating science fiction, which then inspires the next generation of scientists to go out and ask the questions and look for the answers. It's a great feedback loop. I wanted to end with a quote from Mark Twain, truth is stranger than fiction. After our lovely simplistic dropping of rovers on Mars for three times, things got a lot more complicated and honestly, the crane maneuver, the sky crane maneuver that landed the last two rovers, I think has got to be the most wild thing beyond any science fiction that I ever could have imagined. If you haven't ever watched, there's a video clip that I highly recommend called The Seven Minutes of Terror, which explains how this thing works and when I've watched it like a million times, it's really a short little YouTube video you can find. The scientists that created this whole thing explain how it works and why they did it. And every time I watch it, I think, I don't know how these people came up with that. They must have been watching some science fiction movie to figure that one out. But it is, truth can be stranger than fiction. So, you know, we don't need to worry about Martians invading our planet or anything like that. It's fun to certainly watch it in the movies, but the real answers can be even wilder than we can imagine. So I would be happy to take some questions if people have questions about Mars. I, I caution you, I'm not a Mars expert. I just really love talking about Mars. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> oh, you have whatever, okay. <laughs> Uh, 
Yeah, they always greatly underestimate the, the, the duration of these machines on Mars. I think the initial rover was supposed to last like 60 days and it lasted three years. So yeah, the ingenuity is kind of funny uh, when you read about it. It's like, what, is it, what was its mission? Its mission was just to go and fly because we really didn't know if it was even possible for something to fly in that thin of an atmosphere. So it really didn't have like a lot of instruments on it. It has a camera. It's not really gonna do a lot of science. The whole point of it was just to do it and see if we could do it. Do you mean people or the, yeah, just the? Is it the lack of a, of a space race, the lack of a relationship between two countries, or is it government funding? Is it the lack of a relationship Yeah, those are all really good reasons that are, or motivators, if you want to say, for the moon race. Um, I think with Mars, the, the necessary technology is so much more difficult. NASA has it on their calendar. They're saying by 2030, we will send people to Mars. I'm not betting on that. It's, it's incredibly difficult. It's a much longer journey. It may be a one-way journey. Um, so to go to the moon was not easy, but it is so much easier to go to the moon than to anything else. It's just a longer ride. To get to the moon takes three days for the astronauts. Um, so you could do the whole round trip in just over a week. To get to Mars, best case scenario, you're talking like six to nine months, just one way. And so how do you even sus you know, sustain your astronauts for that length of time? We've never done anything like that. Um, there, some of you may know there's a, uh, there was an experiment in the Arizona desert, uh, the Biosphere 2 Center, uh, where we tried to build a self-sustaining capsule. I shouldn't say we, I didn't build it. <laughs> they tried to build a self-sustaining capsule to see if people could basically mimic what it would be like to live on, say, the moon or Mars or whatever. It failed miserably. And, and we've basically never tried it again. Um, so until I see NASA, like, actually building a capsule here on Earth that we can you know, rescue people from very easily, should things go wrong. Um, and doing that successfully, I don't see how they're gonna send people to Mars. It's, it's really hard. Yeah, it's much more, it's privatized for profit, right? But I do say that the, the other companies getting into the game is good because it's in a way to, that we can create new technology. We have a bigger brain trust, we can create new stuff, that's great. But the regulation of it and who's going to be able to put things up into space and, and should they be able to put a Tesla into space, what's the point of that? Um, those are the questions that I don't think people have thought about with this whole privatization of space travel and space exploration. But yeah. Yes. So I, I, what I can tell you is the leading theory, uh, and I think it's a good one um, because it, there's a lot of other evidence. Um, so it's believed the best idea is that Mars suffered a very massive impact at some point in its past. So for a while it developed just like the Earth did. It had a magnetic field. Our magnetic field is really important to retaining our atmosphere. So with the magnetic field, it had an atmosphere. The atmosphere was thicker. It was not all carbon dioxide. It allowed for water to be stable on the surface and the planet evolved at some rate for a while. It suffered a massive impact, uh, which basically did a number of things. It, it 
made the whole surface of the planet non-uniform. We can see that in the craters and things like that. The whole top of the whole north side of Mars is very, very smooth versus the south side is all cratered. There's a huge elevation change from north to south. And it disrupted the magnetic field. That impact would have basically blown away the atmosphere, and without a magnetic field, the planet wasn't able to reconfigure its atmosphere. Without the atmosphere, it was not protected from the solar radiation, which would have slowly evaporated all of the water. Um, so there is water on Mars frozen, and that's actually one of the great things about Total Recall. It, there is ice underneath the surface of Mars, um, and there are these polar caps that we can see on the surface. Um, but without the atmosphere, even if you brought a whole bunch of water to the surface, it wouldn't remain there. So this collision idea is what most scientists think is probably the correct um, mechanism for getting rid of the water on Mars. Um, and it's just sort of a random thing that, that happened, you know, had it not been in the wrong place at the wrong time, it could still be very Earth-like. There has been an, a lander that is kind of right at the edge of where the polar cap is, and it was sent to kind of explore underneath, not under the ice, but near the poles to see about subsurface ice. Most of the information that we have about the subsurface ice has come from orbiters, though. Um, but yeah, we haven't actually landed a craft on the poles. That was, the Polar Explorer was one of the ones that didn't make it, unfortunately. There's two US missions that didn't end up getting there, and that was one of them. So, yeah. So, is there any conceivable scientific theory about how you could hold an atmosphere? Yeah, so Mars, it's a small planet, and mass matters. Um, the gravity on Mars is about 40% of what we have here. So that's part of what makes it a struggle to keep a, any kind of significant atmosphere. This is why the moon doesn't have an atmosphere or Mercury doesn't have an atmosphere. In terms of like if we wanted to terraform Mars and create it, uh, an atmosphere that allowed it to be sustainable for us, I don't know that anybody's worked out how you would do that. Um, like I said, right now there's no magnetic field, and so I don't know how you would regenerate the magnetic field. And without that, any atmosphere that you do create is going to be kind of transitory. So. Oh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Um, you know, <laughs> I think it's greatly exaggerated, uh, but yes, you would not be able to breathe because there is no oxygen on the atmosphere of Mars. It's almost entirely carbon dioxide. So it would be like suffocating. Would their, you know, eyes bulge and their necks, yeah, all of that is, I, I've, I'm not a medical expert, but I've heard that it is greatly exaggerated. So yeah, there'd be some of that, uh, but not to the extent that was, you know, quite graphic in the movie. So. Yeah, yeah. You wouldn't, you wouldn't look that bad suffering. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, in, in the the temperature on Mars varies greatly depending on whether you're in the sun or in the shade. So on the daytime side of Mars, the temperatures actually would get quite hot. On the nighttime side of Mars, it would be incredibly cold. So without an atmosphere to regulate the temperatures, you're at the mercy of the sunlight. Um, but I don't, honestly don't know how long it would take you to suffocate if you didn't have any oxygen. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Is there a window that they would theorize There probably is. I don't know the number off the top of my head. We don't know if, if this impact idea is correct. We don't really know when that happened. But from the geology on the surface, we can tell that this was, the water phase of Mars's life was pretty extensive. There, are, and again, it's many different forms of water that we're seeing. We're seeing rivers and networks of rivers and floodplains, which you know implies a huge amount of water, you know, at a very large rate flowing across the surface.
surface. There are evidences of lakes, um, possibly oceans. So a lot of water, and it, even with this impact thing, it would take a while to evaporate that. So I think people are pretty um, optimistic that there might have been some kind of lower life forms that could develop in that amount of time, and that's what they're looking for in these fossils. We're not looking for, you know, dinosaur skeletons or anything seriously evolved, but very, very small things. That's right. Yep. I think most astronomers would tell you that the, the chances of life elsewhere in the universe, and we again have to not think of just two legs, two arms, and a head, is very likely. You know, the, the possibilities are so large that for us to only be the only planet with life is, is rather egocentric. <laughs> Other questions? Well, the impact, sorry, the, the volcanic activity is tied to the, the heat from the interior of the planet. That's what drives all volcanic activity on any planet, is you have to have a hot interior. And so all of the planets were formed, and they were incredibly hot when they formed. It was a messy formation process that forms planets by smashing things together. So you naturally get a hot planet. And then there's radioactive decay of the elements in the planet. And all of the planet, all the terrestrial planets are kind of got the same general makeup. So Mars would have been really hot when it formed, and therefore it would have had volcanic activity. But it's a small planet. It's got a tenth the mass of Earth, and it's about half the size of Earth. So small things cool off more rapidly which is why the moon no longer has any activity and Mercury has no activity. So we don't think that Mars stayed active for a really long time. We don't know when this impact would have occurred, um, but I don't think the volcanic activity and the impact are tied to each other at all. So impacts won't necessarily get you volcanic activity. But Mars doesn't have any tectonic plates like we do. Um, our planet, as far as we know, is the only one with plate tectonics. So the plate of our planet uh, moves around, the crust of our planet moves around, and that's why you get things like Hawaiian island chains, you know, island chains. So the hot spot that the plate is sitting on is localized, and then the plate moves along, and so you get magma that comes up, and then it's like a little conveyor belt, so a whole little string of islands. Mars doesn't have that. So that volcano is sitting over a hot spot underneath the crust, and every eruption just happens in the exact same spot. So it just keeps building and building this huge volcano, always erupting and adding to the mass. So that's one of the reasons why Mars could have such a huge volcano, because the crust of the planet doesn't move around. Anything else? I always ask the little kids in my planetarium, how many of you want to go to Mars? And I get about 50-50. They all want to go to the moon. <laughs> but Mars, it sounds cool, but when they find out you have to stay in the spaceship for about nine months straight and there's no McDonald's drive through or anything like, they're like, yeah, no, I put my hand back down. <laughs> I don't know if I could find other people I could live with for nine months straight. I mean, the pandemic kind of put me at my limit there, so. Anything else people want to know about Mars or comments? <laughs> well, I'll tell you one of my jokes. Do you guys know how to organize a space party? You plan it. <laughs> that usually ends the talk right there. We're done now. She might tell another one. I'm like. <laughs> Well, if anybody has any other questions or you just want to chat about Mars, I'd be happy to chat with you. Um, our planetarium at, the, at Westchester University will be opening person in person this fall. We are always closed in the summer, but we'll be opening our public programs for live in-person presentations again starting in September. So feel free to, to check us out. We're on Facebook, Mather Planetarium, or we have a website.
Uh, it is in the Schmucker Science Center. Yeah, if you've ever been to campus, you probably never saw it. It's the best kept secret on campus. <laughs> People graduate and they come back and like, this wasn't here when I was here. Yeah, it was. It was. It was built in 1969, so it's, it's been renovated. It's not that old, but and next to, yes, next to Killinger. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everybody.